أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم انفعنا بما علمتنا وعلمنا ما ينفعنا وزلنا علما والحمد لله على كل حال سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم اللهم إني أعوذ بك عن أدلة أو دل أو زلة أو زل أو أدلة ما أذل ما أجهل أو يشحل عليها. So inshallah I just uh, I thought this would be good. Um, you know sometimes people miss miss the session or you know they know they don't they don't know where we're at in the class. So inshallah what I'm going to always do is um, try to have like just show everybody where we are. And another point that I wanted to do with this is, um, you know, to show that this is a science in Islam. You know, it was a couple of people that approached me the last class and they were like, just get to the good stuff. Like, just, just, just get to the, like, how do we purify? And it's like, that's not how you teach. You have to lay the foundation so that you can always go back and say, you remember this? That's why you do this. You remember the companion that I told you about, about such and so and so and so? That's the reason why you have to do this. So you have to lay the foundation first. If you just jump straight into it, you miss everything. You miss everything. Now there's some literature that does that, but they're already expecting you to have a foundation, right? There's a lot of books that are written, you know, you know and they, they go into, um, you know, things that are for somebody who's already seasoned, all right? Uh, so for like, let me give you an example. We have many Muslims who will go and they'll pick up a hadith collection. <laughs> like, somebody will pick up Sahih al-Bukhari. If somebody picks up Sahih bukhari and they don't understand the science of hadith, they will make a lot of mistakes. They will make a lot of mistakes. Because Imam Bukhari, rahimahullah, did not write his Sahih for the layman. He, he, he did not write it for the layman. There is so much that you have to understand before you even approach that book. You bring any scholar worth their weight and ask him that. He'll tell you, yeah, that's right. When you're studying Islamic sciences, the Sahih of Bukhari, the Sahih of Imam Muslim, those are some of the last books that the scholars study. Because there's a lot of stuff that you need before that. You need to understand the Arabic language. You need to understand the classification of fiqh. You, under, you need to understand the differences of opinion. There's a lot of things that you need to understand before you approach that book. And in all of the Islamic sciences are like that. All right, and so this one is no different. We're talking about purifying the soul. We're talking about trying to draw near to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it's a serious matter. It's a very, very serious matter. Okay, so we started off, the very first session was just, we're just like, like, what do you mean purifying the heart? So you go back to the Qur'an. You always start with the Qur'an, all right? Um, and then session two was what is the objective? Like, what are we after? What are we after? What are we going after? So, <laughs> okay. And so we went over the hadith, there can be no rectifying the iman until the heart is rectified. That, you know, we, we're after removing the base characteristics from the heart. Like if you look at an animal, you see how the animal acts. And then you say, okay, well, we're human beings. We shouldn't be like that. And then refining the character. You know, uh, refining, the, re removing the base characters and then putting in those human characters. So in other words, you remove the impulsiveness and you replace it with sabr, patience, hilm. Uh, hilm is forbearance. So if you ask most mothers about forbearance, they can, they can teach you a little something about forbearance. Because they have to forbear their children every single day. All right? that, that just, the, the child causes you pain, the child causes you harm, the child is impulsive, and you have to slow down and be with the child despite the harm. That's forbearance. So, um, 
that's part of uh, uh, refining the character. But then why are we refining the character? To ultimately draw near to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To have experiential knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not because you read it in a book. Not because someone told you. Because you experienced it directly. You experienced it directly. Uh, and I'll give you some examples. Right? But anyway, session three was about contrasting the physical heart and the spiritual heart. All right? so because sometimes when you talk about the heart, everyone is thinking about the flesh that's inside. Right? The flesh, the, 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 the heart that's beating. But within that physical thing that's beating, is that's where the psycho-spiritual material is. That's where the black dots are that Rasulullah said appears on the heart. He's not talking about this physical thing that's beating. If you take that out of somebody's heart and you look at it, you're not going to see any black dots unless he has a physical disease. But you won't see the spiritual diseases there. Okay? You have to be able to see his spiritual form and then see the spiritual heart that's part of his spiritual form to be able to see that. So the first thing that you have to understand is that just like you are physical, you also are spiritual. And like you have spiritual eyes, you have, I'm sorry, you have physical eyes, you have spiritual eyes. You know, okay. Think about this for a second. Just think about this for a second. You have physical eyes. Right now you can see me. Right now you can see people coming and going. You can see that. Right? When you go to sleep, when you go to sleep, you close your eyes, and your, your, your soul is no longer busy with what you're hearing right now, what you're smelling right now, what you're seeing right now, what you're feeling right now. Right? Our, soul, our heart is busy with that right now, so we're, we're occupied with that. But when you go to sleep, when you go to sleep, the heart is no longer occupied with that. And you begin to see other things, even though your eyes are closed. How do you see that? How do you see that? How? How do you see? Because you have spiritual eyes. You hear in your dream. You hear. You hear, sometimes you hear people talking to you, hey, what are you doing over here? Oh, I haven't seen you in a long time. Even though there's no sound, you can hear. That's because you have spiritual ears. All right, so just like you have a physical body, you have a spiritual body. And that's what we're focused on. Okay, this is the secret, people. This is the secret of why you have to pray. Because your, what your physical body does affects your spiritual body. This is the secret. Sometimes other people from other religions, they ask us, yeah, but you pray? Why do you pray? have to pray five times a day. Why can't you just, you know, just have love of God and that's all? No, because you have a spiritual heart. You have a spiritual soul. And just like your physical body, it needs nutrition, the spiritual self, it needs nutrition. All right? So just like you go and you take a shower every day, or we hope, right, at least, right? What the spiritual body needs a bath too. The spiritual, your spiritual self needs it too. All right? Uh... And that's the reason why Rasulullah he said, hey, what would you say? Rasulullah he's giving an analogy. He's speaking to his companions. عنهم, and he says, what would you say about a man? He lives by the river and he dips into it five times a day. What would you say about him? They said, Ya Rasulullah, he would be clean. He would be clean. They said, so he, he gave them the example. This is what happens with a person who prays. You pray five times a day. That's the shower for your spiritual body. 
That's the shower for your spiritual body. Just like you have a physical body, you have a spiritual body. That's what we're focused on. With this science, right, if you want to study what do you do with the body, the physical body, you study fiqh. Right, you learn everything you need to do about fiqh. You learn halal, haram, right? hands in the prayer, moving the hands, where do you put the hands in the prayer, what do you say with your tongue, with the physical body. You, to regulate that, you need fiqh. To regulate the spiritual self, right, which we call the nafs, or we call the, the center of it, which we call qalb, which is, the, which is the heart, the spiritual heart. We're talking about the spiritual heart. It needs this science. It needs how do you purify the spiritual self. Human being is both. The human being is both. He has a physical self. He has a spiritual self. So what we're talking about is how do we purify and help to cultivate the spiritual self. The spiritual self. All right. So that's the reason why I wanted to do session three. Contrasting the physical heart and the spiritual heart so you can know the difference. All right. The physical heart does this. And I gave you all the examples. The physical heart pumps the blood through your veins. The spiritual heart is what earns. It earns the sins. It earns those black dots, right? Or it becomes illuminated by dhikr and prayer and salawat al nabi and recitation of Holy Quran. Okay? That's, the, that's what's happening in the spiritual heart. The physical heart, it, has a, it, it deals with pumping blood. When Rasulullah was talking about the heart, when he's talking about the heart, he's talking about the spiritual heart for this science, for this science. All right? So session four, that's today. This is the fourth session. Whenever you want to talk about purification of the self, you need a model. You need a model. You need people who have done it. So you look at the companions of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned in the Quran what they were up to. What they were up to. Alright? You always have to look at this group of companions of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa when you want to focus on purification of the heart. You have to look at what's known as the Ahlul Sufa. Right? These are the people of the veranda. Sufa in Arabic it means porch or patio, or, you know, veranda. Because when Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he moved to Medina, many of his companions, some of his closest companions that came from Mecca, they were very, very poor. Very poor. How poor? When we think of poor, we think of, oh, I have to go and get food stamps. Right? What if there's no place to go and get food stamps? What if there is no goodwill to go and get used clothing? That poor. They describe some of the companions of the Messenger of Allah وسلم, that they would wear wool. Right? Like if you slaughter a sheep and you, take, you peel off the wool from the animal. Has anybody slaughtered in here before? Slaughtered an animal? Right? And then you skin it. Right? And then you have to cure it so that it can be worn. Okay? So that so the leather underneath doesn't have the smell. And the, and the, the fur doesn't have the smell. Alright? They were so poor that they would make their clothes out of these hides. But when they began to sweat, this is in the hadith, you can read it for yourself. When they began to sweat, they would smell like sheep. They would smell like sheep. Sometimes when we read, we talk about the companions of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we talk about all of the success that they had. We don't talk about the struggle that they had. So we, let's talk about the struggle. Because that is what made them awliya. That's what made them awliya. You read any history book written by non-Muslims, 
and you, 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 you know, they'll tell you, Islam exploded out of the Arabian Peninsula and they conquered the whole known world in less than a century. How did they do that? People who were backwards and, you know, they used to have all these heinous acts. You know, the, the, in the Roman literature, they used to call the Arabs, and no offense, but this is just what they used to call, they used to call them lizard eaters. No one was worried about colonizing. The Romans tried to colonize the whole world. They didn't want anything to do with the Arabs. Why? Because they considered them backwards. Now, you can't civilize these people. You can't civilize them. That was their thought. So when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, right, so just, just building on that a little bit, right, that's the secret of placing the Kaaba in Saudi Arabia. That's the secret of that. Because at first, right, you have all of the prophets, they're going to Jerusalem. They're going to Jerusalem. And then all of a sudden you have this last prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam, coming out of a place where nobody knows anything about, nobody wants to know anything about. <coughs> like what? Somebody's coming out of Arabia and he's saying that he's the messenger of God. And then they start putting in one and two together like, oh yeah, yeah, that's right. Ishmael used to go there. Oh yeah, the, 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 the you know, uh, the Jews used to make pilgrimage. They did. The Jews used to make pilgrimage from Jerusalem to the Kaaba. But as the Arabs became more and more into idol worship, they cut them off. Like, no, 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 no. But then Allah SWT rose. He, he, he brought a prophet from them. Okay? And then these people go on to conquer the world. How did it happen? How? Because they were awliya. There's no other explanation. There's no other explanation. Just think about it. Think about Montana. Think about Montana. Just imagine this. Montana, the outback. Nobody talks about Montana. Can somebody tell me the capital of Montana? One of the young people. What's the capital of Montana? What is the capital? Okay, what's the capital of California? <laughs> Sacramento. <laughs> Sacramento, right? Everybody knows. What's the capital of Montana? One of the young people. What's the capital of Montana? Right, nobody knows. No, it's unheard of. Nothing, nobody wants to know anything about that. That's how Arabia was. No, who cares? Right, but and by the way, it's Billings. All right? It's Billings, all right? Billings, Montana. That's the capital, right? Okay, so imagine that these group of tribesmen just come out of Billings, Montana, and they conquer all of America. What? These backwards hillbillies, no one will accept that, no one would expect that. That's exact, but if they become awliya, if they become friends of Allah, and we're going to read this hadith so that you can understand what Allah does with his friends, then the situation is different, then you can understand it. Okay, then you can understand it. So not only do they come out of Billings, Montana, and they conquer America, they also conquer all of South America. Right? Because not only did they take on two empires at one time, they took on the Roman Empire and conquered all of North Africa, which was under the Romans at that time. And then that's going west until they couldn't go any further, until they couldn't go any further. And then they went east until, you know, they, they conquered all of Iran, which was another great, per, the Persian Empire, huge, powerful empire. That was, that's like them conquering America and Russia at the same time coming out of Billings, Montana. How does it happen? How does it happen? Which takes us to this hadith. So today's hadith, that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he starts off, and this is a hadith Qudsi. Hadith Qudsi, meaning 
Allah is saying it, Allah is the speaker. You know, Allah is the speaker. So Rasulullah is saying Allah said. So he's explaining what Allah has said, but it's not from Quran. It's a different type of revelation that does, does not end up in the Quran. All right? So he says, Allah said, whoever shows hostility or enmity to a friend of mine, I have declared war upon him. My servant does not grow closer to me with anything more beloved to me than the duties I have imposed upon him. My servant continues to grow, grow closer to me with extra good works until I love him. When I love him, I am his hearing with which he hears, his seeing with which he sees, his hand with which he strikes, his foot with which he walks. Were he to ask something from me, I would surely give it to him. Were he to ask me for refuge, I would surely grant it for him, grant it to him. I do not hesitate to do anything as I hate, as I hesitate to take the soul of the believer, for he hates death and I hate to displease him. Sahih al Bukhari. Now let's look at this hadith in depth. The first thing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does is He tells you the rank of the friend, the one who has purified himself and drew near. He's called a wali, the friend, the friend of Allah. This is what you should aspire to. This is what it's all about. This is what you aspire to, to be a friend of Allah. Okay, this is like, this is your birthright, people. This is your birthright. You, Allah, this is what Allah wants from you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants you to strive to draw near to Him. He doesn't want you to strive to be near to His creation. And we strive for His creation. We strive very hard. We want to impress, we want to have a husband. We work hard, right? We buy the best clothes, best makeup, best cars. We want a wife, we work hard. I gotta get a job, take care of my family. We work hard. How did you work for, to draw near to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? What did you do? Okay, so that's what Allah, that's what, your, that's what your potential is. That's your birthright, to draw near to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All right? So Allah says, whoever shows hostility to a wali, friend of mine. In the hadith it says wali, in Arabic it says wali. Whoever shows hostility to a friend of mine, I have declared war on him. So that's the first thing. This is the status of the wali. This is the rank of the wali. This is the rank of the wali. He has so much rank with Allah, that if you just show hostility, he didn't say fight him, he didn't say hit him, he didn't say kill him, he said just show him hostility. I've declared war on you because he's in my camp. That's the rank. So first Allah lets you know, this is the rank of the one who has drawn near to me. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you the game. You want to draw near? I'm going to tell you how to do it. I'm going to tell you how to do it. So he says, my servant. He honored you by saying, my servant. The one who has submitted. He's my servant. He has submitted. In other words, he does the outward acts of Islam. Right? He doesn't grow closer to me. With anything more beloved to me, than those duties that I have imposed upon him. So you look at the fara'id. You look at what does Allah command you to do? What did he command you to do? Those are the five pillars. Right? To declare on the tongue, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. Salat, zakat, Ramadan, hajj. That's the fara'id. And of course you have to learn the fiqh so you know how to do them properly. You have to learn fiqh to know how to do it properly. Fiqh is putting the deen into practice, putting those things into practice. 
How do you do it properly? All right? So that's the first thing. But notice, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, you draw near by doing this. You haven't arrived. The word in Arabic is qurba. Qurba. You, have, you, you draw near. That's why it says, does not grow closer to me. You just draw closer by the obligatory acts. Now, the next line, Allah talks about love. Love. The first line, he says, Qurba. You draw near to me, you do the basics. But then he says, you keep going. You keep drawing closer with extra works. This is where the sunnas come in and the nafila. You do the extra works, now you're going to get Allah's love. And then he tells you the results of that love. Okay? So he says, my, continue, my servant continues to grow closer to me with extra works until when? Until I love him. And to, this is a big mistake, you all, that we make. This is a big mistake that we make. When we say, we love Allah. Oh, I love Allah. I love Allah. Good for you. The question is, does Allah love you? That's the question. Does Allah love you? That's the question. All right? So there was a group of people that came to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and they said that, Ah, oh, Nuhibullah, like we love Allah. And Allah revealed to them, and He gave them like a condition, in kuntum tuhibbun Allah, fattabi'uni. He said, say to them, to claim to love Allah, if you truly love Allah, follow me. يُحَبِّبْكُمْ اللَّهُ وَيَكْفِرَ لَكُمْ ذُنُوبَكُمْ Then Allah will love you and forgive you your sins. Alright? So the question is, how do we earn Allah's love? Here's the answer. Here is the answer. Don't be fooled. Don't let the nafs say, oh, I love Allah, that's enough. There's work to do to earn Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's love. Alright? So then Allah says, until I love Him. He does all these extra things. All right, so if you look at those five pillars, there are extra things that you do. There are extra things that you do. I don't know where the time goes. Uh, there are extra things that you do. So for Salat, there's Sunnas. And after the Sunnas, there's Nafila. And included in the Nafila is Tahajjud. Right, so for every prayer, there's Sunnas. You wake up for Fajr, there's two extra before you pray the obligatory prayer. And the Rasulullah said, don't leave these, even if the horses drag you. Meaning, even if you're in a martial situation, you're in a war situation, don't leave these two rakats. All right? These are the most emphasized prayers, the two sunnahs before Fajr. Why? Because they're connected to tahajjud. They're connected to tahajjud. So he's giving you some good advice. All right? And then there's four before dhuhr, the midday prayer, right? The sun reaches the highest point and then declines a little bit. It's time for dhuhr. There's four before the obligatory, and there's two after. They're both sunnah mu'akkadah, meaning he always did them, he never left them. These are the sunnahs. And then if you want more, pray more after that. And then you have four before asr, as the sun begins to decline in a little bit. There's four before the obligatory prayer. After maghrib, the one we just prayed, you pray three, and then there's two sunnahs after it. The three are obligatory. The two after it, they're the extra that he's talking about here, the extra. That's like the prayer, that's for the prayer. Then you have uh, zakat. Right? Zakat's obligatory, but you can give sadaqah every day. If you don't have any money, at least smile. He said smile. That's sadaqah for you. Just, you see someone, salamu alaikum, how are you? Huh? Right? Like who can't afford a smile? So, you, so there's ways of doing sadaqah. You can give money, you can give food, you can give help. You, that's all sadaqah, right? Um, and then you have Ramadan. Ramadan is the obligatory. But there's sunnahs that you can do after, you know, sunnahs. You can fast Mondays and Thursdays. You can uh, fast the white days. 
right? The 13th, the 14th, the 15th. These are the white days, meaning this is when this, the, moon, the moon is full. So those are called the white days. Um, you know, then Hajj, of course you can make Umrah. Umrah is the extra. So these are all different things, and there's many, many other things that you can do. There's many, many other things you can do to earn Allah's love. Now, when Allah loves you, what happens? And so this is, this is of course, what is this? So what are we talking about here? Right? Allah SWT is mentioning the obligatory acts. He's mentioning the sub, uh, super obligatory acts. But what else? Of course, you have to have good character with this too. You have to give people their rights. All of that falls under like obligatory. You have to have good character. Okay? Th that's the most heaviest thing on the Day of Judgment. The most heaviest thing. The thing that will be heaviest on the, on the scale is how you dealt with the people around you. How you dealt with them. How you gave them their rights. That's the heaviest thing on the scale. So of course, purifying the heart it, it deals with that. Then you earn Allah's love. Now, when Allah loves you, now this right here, the ulama have explained this over and over and over and over and over again. But since we're just beginning, I'm going to give you the easiest explanation. Basically what's happening here is that Allah is removing your veils. Allah is removing your veils so that you can experience Him. That you can experience Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala intimately. Okay? You can know this is true. That the meeting with Allah is true. That the spiritual realm is true. So Allah is removing the veils. But He's putting it in language that you can, you know, you can try and understand. So He says, I am His hearing with which He hears. I am the seeing with which He sees. His hand with which He strikes. His foot with which He walks. And then you become mustajib da'wat. You be, like someone came to Abu Hanifa, one of the early Muslims. He met companions of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he said, Ya Abu Hanifa, I'm getting ready to go to Hajj. What should I ask Allah for at Hajj? And if you read the biography of Imam Abu Hanifa, you'll know that he was extremely, extremely intelligent. He was very, very intelligent. Like, like supernatural intelligence. All right? And so as soon as the men asked him that, he said, he very simply, he said, ask Allah to make you mustajib da'wat, right? Make, ask Allah to make you one of the ones that when you ask, it's answered, <laughs> right? So then you don't have to think, oh, do I, should I ask for this? Or should I ask for this? Or should I ask for all of it? Ask for this? No, simply, Ya Allah, make me one of those whose dua is answered. So every time you say, Ya Allah, bam, it's done. It's done. That's one of the gifts that Allah SWT gives to the wali. That's the gift. Remember, this is Allah's friend. What would you do for your friend? What would you do for your friend? You got somebody that you really love, and they go through something, and they ask you for something? How are you going to respond? Hey man, if it's mine, it's yours. That's the friend of Allah. That's what we're talking about. That's what we're talking, purifying the heart so that you can draw near. So that you can draw near to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And these are just the benefits. These are the benefits, all right? So were he to ask me for refuge, I'll grant it to him. You know when you ask Allah refuge, anytime you say, Allahumma inni a'udhu bika. Anytime you say, oh Allah, I seek refuge in you or I seek protection in you. Anytime you say that, if you're mustajib al-da'wat, if you're wali, Allah grants it to you. And I, like I said in the kutbah earlier, the dua, Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min adhab al-qabr. I seek refuge in you, Ya Allah, from the punishment of the grave. Grant it. Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min fitnat al-masih al-dajjal. I seek refuge in you, Ya Allah, from the mischief of the dajjal. Grant it. Ya Allah, I seek refuge in you that these people do this to me or they grant it. That's mustajib da'wat. 
That's what Allah is saying. Were he to ask me for refuge, I would surely grant it to him. So anytime you say, A'udhu Bika, or you say, A'udhu Billahi, I seek refuge in Allah, Min ash-shaytanir rajim, grant it. That's the wali. That's what we're talking about. All right? And of course, everything that lives must die. But Allah says, because he hates death, because the wali, he hates death. He, he, I hesitate to take his life, but, you know, it's, it's written. It's written. So, I wanted to go over that hadith, right, so that you can understand the rank of these Ahlu Sufa. The rank of the Ahlu Sufa. Okay? So, uh, who's Abdullah? <laughs> All right. So, there were some in Medina. So, so, okay, so the Ahlu Sufa. Who are the Ahlu Sufa? The Ahlu Sufa are the companions of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that were so poor that Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi he had to build a porch on the side of the masjid for them to live in. It was like a porch, it was like a patio. And the, the smallest number was that there were 70 of them. It was 70 of them. How many people are in this room? Imran, can you count the people in the room for me? How many people do we have in the room? Just count them. Right, so there were 70 people, the lowest number, and the highest number was about 300. And these were the poorest of the poor, of the companions of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi One day, the aristocrats of Medina, these are new Muslims, they come to visit Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and he's surrounded by his poor companions. Who are his poor companions? Kabab ibn al-Arat, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, Bilal ibn al-Rabah, right? All of these people, they have this rank with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but at that time, if you were to look at them, you say, who? Who are these people? Right? Some of them were so poor that when they would, they would wear one sheet of cloth, the izar, you know the izar that you tie around your waist? And they were so poor that they did not have underclothing. And so they would tell the women in the back row, because in those days there was, no, there was no wall right there, it was just one big masjid. They would tell the women to delay in raising so that they did not see the private parts of the companions who were praying. Poverty. They were impoverished. But these are the ones who became the elite with Allah. The elite with Allah. All right? Abu Huraira, he comes much later. He comes about seven years after Rasulullah Islam went to Medina. He comes much later. But remember, what's the first, what's the first hadith that he narrates? He talks about his situation. When he first came to Rasulullah he had so much lice in his hair, he asked that during the Hajj, could he remove it? He had so much lice, he was a shepherd. Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu, he was a shepherd. So you know, someone who stays with the sheep and always, you know, the sheep have lice in their fur and things like that. So he had a lot of lice in his hair. And they were biting his scalp. And he asked if, you know, if he could remove the hair. And that's when he asked Rasulullah sallallahu He said, Ya Rasulullah, I hear you say a lot of things. But I, you know, I forget what you say. And then Rasulullah told him to come near and he made dua for him. And now he's the number one narrator of hadith. The number one narrator, more than Aisha radiallahu anha who's second. And she lived with the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa because of that dua. Abu Huraira was one of the Ahlu Sufa. He was one of the people who lived on the bench. He used to be so poor that he used to pass out from hunger. And in those days, the Arabs, you know what I mean, they would put their, you know, like they would put their foot on the chest of the person who they thought was Majnoon. They thought he was crazy. Or they would put, if he was on his stomach, they would put their foot on the back of his neck. So he would be in the masjid and because of hunger, we know the feeling, no food. <laughs> like, oh God, <laughs> right? But real hunger, you get up and start moving around, you pass out. That's real hunger. So Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu, one time he passed out. He passed out from hunger, no food. 
And some of the Arabs walked up to him and started doing that to him. So when he came to, he said, no, I'm not majnoon. I'm just hungry. I'm just hungry. That was, that, these are the people we're talking about, the Ahlu Sufa. We mentioned them today. We mentioned them today, oh, yes, he's the master of hadith. Yes, he is. Right? But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala purified them from their desires overtaking them. All right? These were the Ahlu Sufa. One more, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. Wallahi, he's my favorite companion of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa I love Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. You read all the hadith that he narrated, the time that he had with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and the arguments and things like that that he had with the different companions, you realize he was, he was phenomenal. Radiallahu anhu. He was phenomenal. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, he was the number six one to take shahada in Mecca. Number six. He spent all of his time in Mecca with Rasulullah Islam and all of the time in Medina with Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Okay, very, very poor because he came from a, a very poor tribe. The people paid him no attention. He suffered a lot. He didn't come from a, a tribe like Uthman or Umar or something like that where his tribe could protect him. So he suffered a lot. And he was a short man, very short, small statured man. So they're in Medina. And one day, they, he's climbing the, the, the palm tree. And the companions are sitting around there laughing, laughing at him. Rasulullah said, what are you laughing at? They were like, oh, Abd you know, Abdullah, look, look at him. He's climbing the tree. His legs are so skinny and so scrawny. And uh, Rasulullah said, stop stopped him. Stop, no. Don't laugh at him. And then he swore by Allah, for wallahi, on the day of judgment, those legs will be heavier than the mountain of Uhud. Rank. And then he said things like, whatever, whatever Ibn, uh, Ibn Umm Abd, that was his kunya, his nickname, whatever he gives you, you take it. Because sometimes, one time, you know, sometimes we were like that. Like we, we deal with this person every day and we don't, you know, like, who are you, man? No, no. Rasulullah is like, no. If he comes and tells you something, you take it. And he also, in the different hadith, he said, there is no part of the Quran except that I can tell you where it was revealed, who it was revealed about, all of the context I can tell you about the Quran. And then he is the one who eventually, he goes to Kufa, lays down the, you know, does, teaches all of those people in Kufa, and Imam Abu Hanifa rises up from amongst those people and gathers that knowledge, and that becomes the Hanafi school. Okay, it's very important. But he was one of the Ahlul Sufa. Rasulullah said he used to carry the sandals, the miswak, the wudu container of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he was one of the companions that Rasulullah Sallallahu used to say, you don't have to knock, just come in. Right? You know, when you come to my house, you don't have to knock, just come in. He had that kind of rank with Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi because of his adab. All right? But he was one of the Ahlul Sufa. He was one of those people that was very poor, considered insignificant. Okay, what happens? One day, some aristocrats, these are some new Muslims from Medina. So let's just say all of the, poli let's say that all of the, uh, all of the politicians in Riverside, right? All of the county officials, the board of supervisors, everyone, they be all become Muslim. And they come to Mer Paris Masjid. They come to Paris Masjid with their suits and their BMWs and their Teslas and all that stuff, right? And they're like, we want to talk to the Imam. But the Imam is surrounded by homeless people. He's surrounded by homeless people. And they don't have on any shoes. They smell like the streets. They have, some of them haven't had baths in three days. Well, what are they going to say? Just, just use your imagination. What are they going to say? Because this is, this is the situation with Rasulullah sallallahu The aristocrats started to become Muslim. These are the people in Medina, they have power, they have wealth and they have land in there. They wanna come and they wanna exert, they wanna exert their influence on the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa So they show up and he's surrounded by Bilal radiallahu an and Abdullah bin Mas'ud and you know, Kabab ibn al-Arat and you know all of the Bara ibn al you know and all of these companions who in their eyes why do you have these people around you? We need to talk to you about something important. 
We need to talk to you about something important. And so, Rasulullah so they come in, they see their condition, they see these poor companions, and they say, can you, they tell Rasulullah can you set aside a time where we can come and see you when they're not around? <laughs> That's what they said. That's exactly what would happen. You know what I mean? If the Board of Supervisors or the, or, the, or, the, or, the, or the City Council, if they come here, hey, can you come to our office? <laughs> right? Like, you know, around these people. Same. And Rasulullah because he perceived that this was going to be a change in events, initially he agreed. Because he knew something was going to come out of this to show who they really were. Right? Okay. So the first thing he says is, uh, mm. Okay, so this is Surah Al-An'am. Surah Al-An'am. Surah Al-An'am. And this is what Allah says. As soon as Soon as Rasulullah Islam agreed to that, he, he didn't agree because he, he, he knew what was getting ready to happen. So this is, and this is what Allah revealed. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم ولا تدرد الذين يدعون ربهم بالقادات والعشي يريدون وجهه وما عليك من حسابهم من شيء وما من حسابك عليهم من شيء فتد 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 ردهم فتكون من الظالمين. Look what Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says. Don't turn away from those who call upon their Lord by day and night. That's how Allah describes them. He didn't say the poor, the misfortunate, the Ahlul Sufa. He said, no, no, no. Those who call upon Allah by day and night. So what is Allah saying here? I'm watching them. The, I want them. Okay? Only wanting his countenance. Yuriduna wajhahu. They only want Allah's face. They only want to be near to Allah. That's it. That's all they want. This is how Allah describes them. And then He says, Ma alaykum min hisabihim. You, you don't have to, you're not accountable for them, and they are not accountable for you. But then He tells him the situation, right? He says, If you were to turn away from them, then you would be one of the wrongdoers. Min al -zalimin. Those who do dhulm. That was the first verse that was revealed about the Ahlul Sufa. Okay? That was the first verse. Five minutes? Okay. All right. So that was the first verse about the Ahlul Sufa. Okay? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Ka'ab ibn al-Arat, he said that after that verse was revealed, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa would spend so much time with us. Not in the masjid, but in the sufa, so on the side of the masjid. He would go and spend so much time with them that they came up with a scheme themselves. Because they're like, he's the Rasul, he has other things to do, he has family. We're going to tell him, we're busy. And then we're going to get up and go, so that he can go and do his thing. And that's what they did. They were like, we started telling Rasulullah so they said, Ya Rasulullah, we're busy, we gotta, so that he can go. And because he would spend all of his time based on this verse. All right? Now look at this verse. And this is in Surah Al-Kahf. Right? This is in Surah Al-Kahf. Allah reveals another verse about them. Okay? Allah reveals another verse. And He says, Uh, where is it? Where is it? Ah, أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم. واصبر. Be patient. واصبر لهم. Uh, no, I'm sorry. That's not the right one. 
What was it? Ah, oh, there we go. Shukran. Wasbir nafsaka. Make yourself patient. Ma'alladheena yada'oona rabbahum. With those who call upon their Lord. Biligadati wal ashiyi. Day and night. Yuriduna wajhahu. Same verse. But now he's telling him, be patient with them. Right? I'm doing something with them. So you be patient with them. He's telling Rasulullah the rank of these people who the aristocrats are like. Those people? Who are those people? Right? Wajhahu. Um. Wala ta'du aynaka anhum. Don't turn your eye away from them. Don't look away from them. Anhum. Turidu zinnat al hayat al dunya. Desiring the, the world. Okay? He's not talking about things. He's not talking about things. Really, what he's referring to is those people who were desiring status. They, they came to Rasulullah and said, give us a time where you're not with them. We'll come, you know, we got important things to talk to you about. Th that's their dunya. That's them. That's, that's their dunya. They want status. They want influence. Okay? And so, uh, and then Allah goes on to say that their hearts are, you know, they're diverted from the remembrance of Allah. Uh, they follow their desires. And, and their affair has become furata, like hopeless, a far out thing. Okay? This is, this is, this is, both of these verses were about the Ahlu Sufa. And they became the Imams of this Ummah. Okay? They became the Imams of this Ummah. How? Their spirituality. By their spirituality, they became Imams of this Ummah. So when you're reading about Abu Huraira radiallahu an, you have to know where he started and where he ended. Now you can't read a hadith collection that doesn't say, Abu Huraira said, you can't read a hadith collection, right? That's, that, 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 that's you know, about Bilal not being the Mu'adhan and the status that Rasulullah Islam gave him. You can't read a hadith collection about Abdullah bin Mas'ud, like, like he's one of the most famous of the companions of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa so this is where we start. The Ahlu Sufa, the people of the veranda, the poorest of the companions of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam outwardly. Okay, and there were some that they had wealth, but they began to shun it. I didn't get to that part, inshallah, we'll pick up there next week. We'll pick up there how they lived, what they were after, how they live, you know, how they lived their lives. Because then you'll see that they are the spiritual imams of this ummah. And when you're talking about spirituality, you're talking about purifying the heart, you have to look at them. They are the examples. You always have, whenever you're talking about something, you have to have an example. You have to know, we look at Rasulullah first, and then we look at his companions, and then we look at the, the, their students, then we look at their students, then we look at the imams after them. Like, these are our models. These are our models. So starting with spirituality, of course, we look at Rasulullah and then we look at those who he taught, those who he cultivated, how he dealt with them. And then what happened to them as a result? We'll talk about the jinn who came to Abu Huraira. Three times. Jinn. And he saw him the way I'm seeing you. Umar ibn al-Khattab. He saw jinn. And he said his hands, you know, he said he could barely see his face because he had on a hood. But he said that his, his hands looked like the paws of, of a dog. It's in Tafsir ibn Kathir. His hands looked at the paws of a dog. What's their spiritual state that they experience these things? What's their spiritual state that they see these things? And you, Wallahi, you, 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 Fatima, yes, you have the same potential. Wallahi, you have the same potential to be Arif Billah. To know, to be a knower of Allah, to be a knower of Allah, to be close to Allah, to experience Allah, you intimately, you know. But it takes some cleaning up, so we got to do some cleaning up. So, any questions? Yes, Salam Alaikum. Hmm. 
two after. Yes. Uh, what time to pray Asr? No, there's nothing after Asr. Before Qabli. So before, there's four, but there's Sunnah Ghayr Mu'akkada, which means that he did it sometimes. Sometimes he made the four before Asr, sometimes he, made, he didn't. So that's, uh, but all the, all the other ones that you mentioned, they are Mu'akkada. He always did it. He always did it. But the four before Asr, he did sometimes, he left sometimes. So, so the sunnah is, 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 you know, like he did it all the time. And he encouraged everyone to do it. Whereas nafila is, you have a choice. It's, it's, not, it's not sunnah. You can make as many as you want after Maghrib. You can make as many as you want after Isha. You can make as many as you want after Dhuhr. But that wasn't his regular practice. But you can do it. You know, you can do it. And you'll get the reward. So that's the difference. Nafila is, you can, you can do as many as you want. But, uh, but it wasn't his regular practice. OK, I'm being told, shut up, tabari. That's it. Subhanallah, wa hamnihi na shara wa la ilaha ila anta astaghfiruka wa natubu ilaik. Subhanahu rabbi ka rabbi al-izzati amma yusifun wa salamun ala al-mursaleen. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen wa rahmatika ya rahman rahimeen. Wa sallallahu ala khayri al-kalkihi ya shara fil anbiya wa mursaleen. Habibina wa shafi'ina wa maalana Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa barakatuhu wa sallam tasliman mubarakan kathira.